Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really pleased to see you here. My name is Camille Crittenden. I'm D Deputy Director of Citrus, and I also direct the Data and Democracy Initiative here. We are very pleased to see you here at this research exchange lecture. And before I introduce the speaker, just a couple of brief announcements. Um, I want to welcome not only the people who are here in person, but also those who are watching via live webcast on Citrus-affiliated uh, campuses. Those are at Merced, Davis, and Santa Cruz. So we're always pleased to have people who are watching from there or from their homes or living rooms or studios or wherever they might be. We really encourage you to uh, think of questions and discussion for later, and those can be submitted or um, asked here in person or through our Twitter stream. So uh, we'll have someone monitoring that as well if you want to participate that way. Um, happy to provide lunch. We want to remind you that we have composting bins and such in the back, but also to remind you that, unfortunately, the aluminum is landfill. So please stick that in the trash can and not in the recycle bin. Um, I hope that you'll come back, actually, on Monday morning. We're going to have a special event with uh, an author and musician and thinker named Jaron Lanier. Um, you might have seen his book, You Are Not a Gadget, or Who Owns the Future. He's a very innovative thinker um, and lives here, actually, in Berkeley. The title of his talk is How Can We Prevent Information Technology from Destroying the Middle Class? So you'll see he'll be quite provocative and should be a really interesting event. Uh, I hope you'll come. Um, registration for that is open. The event is free, but like you did probably for the event today, please go to the Eventbrite site to register just so we know how many people to expect. I also want to call your attention to the Big Ideas competition. This is run every year through the Blum Center, and Citrus is sponsoring uh, several categories of that competition, one on IT for Society, which is from Citrus overall, and then the Data and Democracy Initiative is co-sponsoring two categories, one in human rights and one in open data. So please take a look at that. Uh, the upcoming pre-proposal deadline is November 5th. So um, those are some great opportunities, and it's always really exciting and inspiring to see what Berkeley students and those from other Citrus campuses and uh, actually other campuses within um, that higher education network uh, are able to come up with. So take a look. I am really delighted to have uh, here this morning Joe Fish K to speak to us about tracking personal finances. Um, this is a really fascinating topic for many people and a little bit outside of what we um, offer frequently in the research exchange series. So I think it's nice to have some fresh ideas and fresh topics um, to introduce to the series. Joe Fish K is a senior research scientist in the Human Computer Interaction Research Group at Yahoo Labs. His research explores the social, cultural, and technological effects of technology on people and shows how people's decisions and behaviors can change those technologies. These studies have recently included studies of families' values and technology choices, visualizations of Twitter and publications, and the use of NFC-enabled phones to help track clean water supplies in Haiti. Very wide-ranging portfolio. His previous work has included ethnographic, cultural, critical, and technological studies of grassroots creative leisure practices, such as hacking and tinkering, academics archiving practices, couples in long-distance relationships, the role of women in computing, and notoriously computerized smell output and smart homes and kitchens. He has a PhD in information science from Cornell and a master's degree in media arts and sciences and a BS in cognitive science, both from MIT, and is occasionally a consulting assistant professor at Stanford. Please join me in welcoming Professor Joe Fish Kay. Hi all. Thank you very much, Camille. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And as mentioned, I think this is a little bit of a departure from some of the work that I've seen in this series. At the same time, um, I think there's some really interesting issues around personal finance that uh, I hope to illuminate in the course of this talk. One of the things that, as you heard from that list, I have a reputation for doing some, a quite wide-ranging set of research. Um, the work that I do is always about how people connect with each other and the various ways in which they think about their relationships and express their relationships. And I think this very much ties into that larger frame. So what I want to do today is talk through, give you a little introduction to who I am, talk a little bit about finance and why I think it matters, um, 
And then I'm going to focus on how we studied it. Because one of the things that's difficult about finance that's unlike other topics is it's very hard to find out about it. So if I'm studying how you use your smartphone, I can sit down with the person next to me and say, well, how do you use your smartphone? Can you show me? What apps do you have on there? And, it, you know, and that's okay. Um, I can't sit down to my colleague, to the person next to me, and say, how much money have you got? Uh, where is it? And, and how do you know how much money you have? Right? We, we, that's a very difficult conversation to have. So I'm going to organize this talk, and I'm going to talk about the ways in which we came up with techniques to try and get those stories out of people that I think have turned out to be quite useful. I'm going to talk with a couple of things about finance at the end, and then there's some topics for discussion about why I think this matters. And particularly, I think, why this matters in a way that ties into the, the overall theme of the Citrus work um, in how it matters for people in California, how it matters for people in the United States and in the world. So, as mentioned, I'm a senior research scientist at Yahoo, and I have a couple of degrees. Um, I teach at Stanford off and on. I've been teaching the Designing Liberation Technology course there uh, with Terry Winograd and Josh Cohen and Zia Youssef. Um, and I'm going to be teaching the intermediate level HCI class there in the spring. Um, I do work with Sig Kai, um, where I'm vice president at large. And I should point out that I'm also a father to um, two, frankly, gorgeous twins, who I include pictures of here, because you don't want to see a picture of me, because um, they're far more attractive and, like, totally cute. So that's Lizzie and that's Becca. Just, there'll be a quiz later. So let's talk a little bit about finances. So the first thing, like any good academic, I go in and I say, well, I'm going to see what other people have written about this. And uh, I'm an HCI researcher, a human-computer interaction researcher. So I first went to look to the literature in human-computer interaction on finance and money and things like that. And there's hardly any. I mean, it's something that's mentioned in passing a few times. Um, and it's slightly strange because there's a lot of popular press look work on this, right? Um, there are websites that are about this. There are books that are about this. Um, you know, how to get rich, uh, uh, Tony Robbins stuff, Suze Orman, um, these people who are very interested in, in, in providing these solutions about how to make more money and, and how you should think about these things. But I was looking at something that had a little bit more uh, analytical approach. Um, and in behavioral economics, there's a bunch of interesting stuff here, stuff like Viviana Zelander's work um, from uh, at Princeton. Um, and that's that first piece here, the social meaning of money. That's a largely historical analysis, but that was something that turned out to be a useful thing to, to, to work with. Um, this, the second book that I bother mentioning here, The Stocks et al., is this fabulous book in which uh, they got some researchers together, clearly at a conference and clearly over beer, um, and they said, why don't we do the same study in three different countries? So they got a bunch of people in Ohio, a bunch of people in a small sort of uh, some t town in Sweden, and a bunch of people in um, Barcelona, I think it was. It might have been Madrid. And they did ask them the same set of questions about how do you think about your money as a, as a married couple. Um, interestingly, the area where most of the work that's been done on how people manage their finances is in developmental psychology. Um, sorry, not developmental psychology. Um, developmental work in uh, like ICT for D, that kind of domain. So this book, The Portfolios of the Poor, How the World's Poor Live on $2 a Day, is a fabulous book. They went into slums in a couple of different places, um, and they said, well, how do you manage your money? And they looked very carefully at that. And it was interesting because there are, there's some analogous work being done in, in, in other places. There's some work being done with a, there's an institute for financial inclusion based mainly at NYU and the New School. Um, and they've been doing some work in this kind of domain. But I, I was trying to find something that was analogous for middle-class families. And it was remarkably rare. Uh, also on the developmental side, the stuff that Jan Chipchase and his colleagues have done, uh, he spent a lot of time in Afghanistan walking around there. So I present this to sort of give you a vague idea of what this landscape looks like. And, and it's a pretty thin landscape for this particular domain I'm trying to understand. Um, what we wanted to do was find people who were, and I'm going I'm I'm to apologize in advance for saying this, kind of normal. right? We were not looking for people who... Uh, was, say, unbanked, right? Something like 3%, 3 to 6, depending who you ask, percent of the U.S. population doesn't have a bank account. 
Um, and that's, that's, that's an area that we didn't want to, to, to really spend a lot of time. And we also didn't want to deal with people who were very rich. That's another domain. And we wanted people who we were particularly interested in people who were very active traders, people who were trading stocks and shares and bonds all the time. They have particular information needs, and that's not something that we were particularly interested in for this. For this, we wanted people who were, again, sort of normal, right? So we got some diversity here. The biggest diversity we got was in terms of ages, right? Um, Steve is about 25, Alan is 28, Doug here is 68, I think, um, Anthony, maybe Doug is 69 and Anthony is 68. Um, we wanted people who did and didn't have children, so the number in brackets is the number of children, so Doug has four children, Jane has three, Steve has one child who is, oh, I think he was about three months when we went along, and it's the smilingest little kid you ever did see. Um, some of these people have, most of these people have jobs, um, not all of them. Steve is unemployed. Uh, Doug and Anthony are retired. Bonnie is going to retire as soon as possible. Um, but we got some diversity. Uh, they're all in the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, as you all know, that reduces the amount of diversity. Or rather, it introduces a particular strange kind of diversity because people in the Bay Area are in many ways not like people in a lot of, of the rest of America and they're not like people in a lot of the world. Um, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing, but, it, but it's just something to acknowledge. And we tried to get, we did a bunch of people around Berkeley, Oakland, Richmond, some people in the city, some people a little further down in the South Bay. Um, we had one person out in uh, Sassoon City, um, which gave us some very interesting results. But we wanted something that we could get to and we could go into these people's homes and talk to them. So we would go, we would call, we would um, call them up, we'd make an appointment and we'd go along. Usually they'd remember we were coming, sometimes they wouldn't. Um, we'd go in and we'd give them the loyally NDA and we'd do some recording um, and we would keep track of what they were going to say. And then we said, okay, before we go into any real detail, uh, tell us who lives in the house. Who's, what's their names, what their ages, what are their jobs? Um, we got the very basic stuff down. And then we said, well, okay, we'd like you to draw a map of your finances. And then people said, well, what do you mean, draw a map of my finances? I don't have a map of my finances. And we said, well, okay, just draw something that you feel represents in some way a map of your finances. So this is one. This is Alan. Um, Alan's 28. Alan uh, is a lawyer. He graduated pretty recently from law school. And he had got accepted. He got a free ride into... Um, I forget what law school it was. It wasn't particularly highly ranked. He said it was ranked about 300th in the country, something like that. So it's sort of down there. He also got accepted to Hastings um, in the city, uh, which is quite good law school. It's ranked about 30th in the country. And so he had this dilemma. Should he go for the less good law school um, for free, or should he go to the, good, the, the much better law school, but then take on $120,000 in debt? So he chose to, to go to the good law school and to take on 120000 in debt. But it worried him. Alan was so worried about his debt. This was, I mean, you can see this from this picture here. It absolutely dominates what he thinks his, uh, when he thinks about his finances. And we, the more we talked to him about this, the more it was clear that this was a concern. So he and his wife both worked. Um, she worked in Oakland at a, at a software startup of some kind. Um, they were completely living off her salary. His money, which was slightly, he got paid slightly more than she did, um, all went to the student loan. So it was, he was paying it off as fast as he possibly could. They were living like church mice. Um, they had turned the heat off to the gas um, so on, the, on the furnace so that they would save money there. They were like eating, you know, they had big jars of peanut butter in the kitchen and eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches because they were going to pay off this debt and that was the most important thing. They were doing a little bit of savings on the side, right, because they had a little bit of 401k matching, which was sort of a good incentive. But really, Alan was very much concerned with this debt, and that, that absolutely dominated him thinking about his finances. This is Octavia. Um, Octavia is a doula. How many people here know what a doula is? About half, a little bit around that. A doula is a, a woman who help, or a person who helps a mother during childbirth. Or just after, or just after childbirth, um, as well. A postpartum doula is just after childbirth. Um, so she's not trained like a midwife. It's a relatively simple training scheme to to, to be a doula, um, but they are an advocate for the mother. Um, and you can see that she thinks about her uh, 
the way that she, that she manages her finances, it's a bit more of a, of, of a balancing act, right? So she's self-employed, so she says, well, okay, there's the childbirth stuff, um, there's the doula work down here, this is CBE, childbirth education, she teaches classes about having children and things like that. Um, and over here, she also does in, independent research. She has uh, two partial master's degrees from Columbia um, due to a sort of disastrous series of decisions. Um, short version, if you're going to go and do a master's degree in something, don't stop halfway through and then do another master's degree. It's not a very good way to get the first master's degree. Um, and then on the other side, she's got her debt and liability. She does have these student loans, which is her largest uh, debt category, um, but really, it's dominated by her living expenses. She has to pay rent. She has to uh, manage things like her um, health care is very important. So she needs to get flu shots. She needs to get um, various other medical things because she's a medical practitioner in this way. One more. This is Charlotte. Um, Charlotte lives up in Sassoon City. Uh, she lost her job as a... Uh, she was working at a hotel as a, as a sort of medium-level manager... Um, and she lost that job about four or five months ago with some pretty devastating effects on, uh, on really everything. She's now working four jobs. She is a uh, night auditor at another hotel. She stocks shelves at Walmart uh, on evenings and, and weekends. Um, she is a su security guard at Ross, the clothing store. And there's one more that I've lost. She has one more job that I think is another security guard job, if I remember properly. Um, and when we asked her to draw a, a map of her finances, she said, well, I, I don't know how I would do that. Um, I'm not quite sure what you're looking for. Are you looking kind of for a pie chart where, where my money goes to? Are you looking for an emotional reaction to my finances? Uh, wh what are you looking for? And we're like, well, we want all of those. She says, well, I'm not sure how I would do this. And then we said, well, why don't you do it wrong? Do it wrong to begin with. And then we'll fix it, uh, and then we can work with you to sort of figure out so it's something that you feel does represent it. She says, well, honestly, since I lost my job last year, I'd have to say it feels like a giant storm cloud. Draw the storm cloud. It's always hovering there. It's angry all the time, and the jobs are, the kind of jobs are kind of like stick feathers figures holding an umbrella. And sometimes the umbrella is really flimsy because the job is not great and it doesn't pay so great. It's still helping a little bit. The, and all of these jobs are coming to the center point of, of trying to reach my goals. The goals would be more time with the kids, um, less jobs. I've been juggling jobs, multiple jobs for years now. I want to be a corrections officer, which is part of where the guard card going to North Bay, getting that background is going towards. So she drew this picture. And the thing I want to emphasize with this picture, um, finances are emotional, Finances are emotional, personal things. And the things that happen as part of your finances end up mattering a great deal. Um, one of the jobs that Charlotte had, it's the one that I forgot, I'm sorry about that. The one that I forgot was delivering ad papers. So you know you get those papers, that, the newspapers that, that are just papers full of ads. So she had a weekly, there was a weekly one of those in her city, and she would deliver it. Um, and the way it worked was that she'd get a huge stack of them on about uh, Sunday, and she'd have all of her friends over on Tuesday night. They'd get pizza, and they'd watch movies, and they'd put rubber bands around them, right? Rubber band, rubber band. And then she'd drive in her car, and she'd deliver the papers by sort of throwing them out the window kind of thing. So she'd been doing this about three months before we talked to her, and uh, her boyfriend was sitting in the passenger seat, and there was a discussion with some people in the street, and he got shot and killed. And we were, I mean, obviously she was, this was as devastating as you think it might be. Um, and we were talking to her about this because it mattered and it came up as part of the discussion. Um, and remember, she's still doing this job. She no longer goes down that one street, but she still does the rest of this job. And I think that's, again, this way in which finances are these emotional things. And obviously there was this huge emotional loss from her boyfriend dying, but it's also tied into her job, and it's tied into the things that she does and she spends time with every day. So the maps, I think, were the first step in establishing this relationship of trust between us and these people who were telling us these stories. Um, it meant that we, we weren't getting things wrong. 
they weren't getting things wrong. We weren't here to judge them and say, oh, you're doing your money wrong. You should sort it out. You should get it right. We were saying, well, okay, what is the system that you're currently doing? So we then went and we did a very simple thing. We took these cards and we put them down in front of them. And we said, how many of, have any of these had a financial effect on you? And what I love about this as a way to ask questions is it lets people decide to do these. So Charlotte picked up the death card and told us about her boyfriend. We had people telling us about their family's medical expenses. We had people telling us about how um, they'd hoped to, to be able to buy a home one day, um, about how they were planning for a family. And I love this because it's so wonderfully amateur, right? This doesn't look, look, look like, like it's too technical. It's like me and a Sharpie and a stack of index cards. But it also meant that by the ways that we chose the words, um, we could get the kind of effect that we wanted to have. Um, have any of you gone and talked to a financial planner ever? Some? Very little. One of the things is that they'll talk about um, estate planning. And you're like, estate plan? I don't have an estate, right? And they're like, no, no, estate. It turns out estate planning is financial planner speak for dead. Right? If you're going to die, like that's what estate planning means. Um, but note that we didn't say estate planning, we put death. Um, getting away from the, these, these sort of accepted euphemisms and, and putting like the simplest ways that we could phrase these things, I think did really help. Um, the next thing we would do is after we'd got a whole bunch of stories from that, was we wanted to ask them, what did they carry in their wallet? Um, What's nice about what you carry in your wallet is it ties into your daily habits, right? It ties into the things that really sort of matter to you. Um, and if you think, go back in history about the things that people carry in their wallets, generally people seem to have started carrying coins on a regular basis about 500 years ago. Um, and obviously this happened at different times in different places. Um, Romans did it earlier than that. Chinese definitely did it a bit earlier than that. Um, but in places sort of sustained, you know, you can point to a place where have, for 500 years people have carried coins. Um, around 1600, the lock technology kind of came in. Um, the sort of flat key that's probably most of the keys that you carry, that's, that's early 20th century. That's like the 19 teens. Um, that starts to become more common. Banknotes. Banknotes come in around the 1700s at some point, and people start carrying banknotes on a regular basis. Um, again, that's something where, China, where in China they've done it for earlier than that. But then there wasn't anything interestingly new up until the credit card, right? The credit card came around um, 1970, 1968, I believe. Diners Club was 1968, I think. Um, could be off 58. On the scale that we've got here, it's about the same, right? Um, and people started carrying credit cards. And I think credit cards are a fabulous thing. Now, uh, I don't know how many of you have taught classes in which you get people to build new projects. Um, but if you said, well, I want you to build a project for your class project, um, this, I want you to build a system that you can use to spend money anywhere in the world. Um, it needs to be robust. It needs to work without having a battery, ideally. Um, you need to be able to spend money. You need to be able to track how much that money was spent. Uh, you need to get a list of what you were spending on later. Um, okay, Go. And you can imagine sort of the app that you'd have to build to do that, right? Um, and people saying, well, okay, how do we do the authentication? How do we manage this system? Um, it would be very tricky to have an app on your Android or, or your iPhone um, to do something like that. But credit cards managed to fulfill all those functions in this really interesting way. Um, they have other problems, and we'll talk more about difficulties with credit cards and why they're not all a barrel of laughs later. Um, but credit cards are an interesting object that people started to carry in the last 50 years. <coughs> of course, the most recent thing that we start... <coughs> oh, excuse me. The most recent new thing for us to carry around is cell phones. Um, people started carrying cell phones within the last 10 or 15 years, something like that, depending who you ask and depending where you are. And I think we still don't fully understand what the impact is of carrying uh, an electronic device around. I mean, it continues to change how people do things every day. Um, you see, it's interesting that cell phones, despite a lot of promises, mainly have not replaced the other objects that we carry around. Mainly, we're still carrying around cell phones um, in addition to these other objects. Although we actually saw a lot less cash than I thought we were going to. I thought we were going to see a lot more cash. And when we looked at previous work that's been done by people like Ken Anderson and Scott Mainwaring, 
and Michelle Chang when, uh, at uh, Intel, they report, the numbers are anecdotal, but the report was that people were carrying a lot more cash when they did that study 10 or 15 years ago. And with things like clipper cards um, and obviously credit cards, people are spending less money, uh, less cash. But I, I don't have statistics on that yet. I'm not quite happy about um, proclaiming that one from the rooftops. But it does seem to be a trend that I saw. Um, except for people who are heavy users of farmer's markets. I, I, I go through a lot of cash because we buy all of the food for all four of us at the farmer's market every Sunday. So I carry around these huge wads of cash. Well, not huge. <laughs> I'm sound, sounding like, please come and mug me, right? <laughs> um, but with that exception, in general, we saw a bit less cash than we expected. So let's look at a wallet. This is Rachel. Uh, Rachel is a photographer in Oakland. She's a wedding photographer. Um, and she brought out her wallet, and we were like, good God, look at this thing, right? This is, this is kind of... Now, the ones on this side are mainly, we don't care about them, they're, or rather, they are, they are not financial instruments, right? You know, you've got your Office Max card or your AirTran card. I don't, you know, Safeway, I don't really care about those ones. But mainly, these are credit cards and sort of... There's a health, there's a health card there, but these are, are credit cards and things like that. And we're like, well, this is a very elaborate system, and so we asked her to get the cards out, and we found that she had, because she had this small business, she had this very elaborate system where everything she had duplicated, her personal stuff and her work stuff. Um, so she had an ATM card for, for, for her photo business. She had, a cash, she had uh, two different credit cards for her photo business, one MasterCard, one Visa. Um, one was a debit and one was a credit card, I think, actually. I can't remember what the exact thing was. Um, but this idea of sort of splitting up these two systems, and this is something we saw a lot uh, in small businesses. Small businesses would have these multiple uh, ways of, 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 of uh, simultaneously managing, managing their professional lives and their personal lives. Um, and sometimes they would bleed into each other more than others. And this is the theme we'll be coming back to. Um, the idea that people have these pots of money, uh, these both income streams and outgoing streams, um, and the ownership of those is sometimes more ambiguous than you might think. But let's look at this wallet. This is Bonnie. Bonnie is 58 years old. Uh, she lives um, she lives over in in Oakland. Um, she uh, works for the government. She's a um, if you workman's comp, like she answers the phones at the workman's comp place. She's a claims adjuster there. Um, and what's interesting about her wallet is well, we've got a couple of credit cards up here, right? Um, she has the American Express card solely because she shops at Costco, and that was this, this, this trend that we saw in a couple of people, the people who were members of Costco only takes American Express, and so people would only have an American Express card to buy things at Costco and under no other, no other circumstances. But for Bonnie, the Costco membership was an important part of who she was. Um, the most interesting thing here uh, are these objects here and up here and up here, and these are rain checks. Um, how many of you know what a rain check? How many of you do? Any, does anybody not know what a rain check is? All right, I didn't know what a rain check was because it's this very American thing. You don't know this, but it's a very an Ameri it's a very American thing. Um, and so I had to have. So I'm going to explain for, for the for the non-Americans in the audience. Um, let's say a company advertises um, that they are that you can buy apples for 39 cents a pound. Um, and you go along, and they're all out of apples. And they say, well, we did advertise it, so we're going we're gonna to come through. So they would then give you a rain check saying, you can have up to, at some future date, you can have up to five pounds of apples at 39 cents a pound. Um, and that's exactly what this uh, rain check says up here. It's, for, it's for up to five pounds of apples at 39 cents a pound. Because you've gone along, and fine. Um, this one is the slightly more interesting rain check. This rain check was for corned beef, and I forget exactly what the price is for the corned beef, and I can't read it on this projector. Um, but it was, it was a rain check for corned beef at some, I think it was 4 50 or so a pound, for up to N pounds, 3 pounds, 4 pounds. Um, now, again, for the non-Americans in the audience, uh, corned beef is a substance that Americans only eat once a year. Um, they eat it on St. Paddy's Day, like, or roughly around then, which is the middle of March. And we were interviewing her in February. So she had had this sticking around in her wallet for 11 months. And you're like, well, that's really interesting, right? If you've got this artifact you've been carrying around. And I was like, well, are you particularly fond of corned beef? And she's like, mm -hmm, it's all right. <laughs> but for her to have this, she couldn't bring herself not to have this, right? You know, once she had got this, this rain check, 
For her, frugality was a very, very important part of who she was and what she did. And as she told us a bit more about her life, we, we started to understand that a bit more. So um, both of her parents had been in the Holocaust. Uh, they had both fled Poland into Siberia and had ended up in Oakland um, via Siberia. And he had set up a small um, shoe store, shoe shop, like shoe repair, cobblers, um, and uh, had lived very frugally their whole lives. I mean, and for Bonnie, this living frugally was a very important part of who she was. She described herself as a frugal person. Um, and this particularly came out when she was talking about cars. We said, uh, what are you going to do when you retire? Uh, because she said it was going to happen. She said, well, I'm going to buy a Corvette. And we're like, okay, that's great. And this came up one or, more, or, one or two more times in the course of the interview. And at the end of it, we, say, we said, after we, you know, she had logged into her checking account for us, and we had seen that she had about 60000 in checking, something like 55000 in checking. Um, and she said, well, you could clearly afford a Corvette. Right? We, went, we actually went on the Internet in the background and looked up the prices. You know, there's one up the road, and you could get it for 35000 and whatever, whatever. And she said, oh, well, it's a little bit difficult because I need to keep the Corvette in the garage and there's only room for one car in the garage. Um, and she has a car that she, wears, she, she drives on a regular basis. But it turns out that when her mother died, they found $15,000 in cash in an envelope in her mother's house. And this is, uh, this is a sort of a horrible sentence to say, this is very typical Holocaust survivor financial behavior, right? This is sort of, this is reasonably well documented as a thing that happens. Um, you know, you don't trust governments, you don't trust ATMs, you have cash so that you can bribe your way across the border if things happen. Um, so she had taken this cash and she had bought, uh, this was in 1989, she bought a 1986 Nissan Z300, I think it was, or 310, a sports car. She bought a sports car. Um, and this had been in the garage and she loved this sports car very much. And she said, well, it's time to sell the, the, the Z. Uh, I love it very much, but it's time to sell it. Um, but I need to redo the paint because I had a paint job done and it wasn't very good. And I haven't decided, should I do the cheap paint job, which is about $1,200, or should I do the expensive paint job, which is about $2,200? And she said, oh, so I haven't decided which one to do. And I, I have to do the paint job before I can actually do this, um, before I can, uh, I can sell it. Now, the, the resale vice, the price of a 1986 Nissan Z in mint condition is about $5,000, Right. Um, in slightly banged up condition, it ain't even $5,000. Um, and it makes no sense, financially speaking, to go and do even a $1,200 paint job on a, on a car of that, that cost, right? And that's one of the things that brought home this realization to us that financial objects do not have, are not, objects that are expensive are not necessarily financial objects, right? People value things that, think of, that look like financial decisions from the outside in different ways. Um, I'm currently wearing a wedding ring. I own a house. Um, I own a kind of crappy car. Um, so my wedding ring is probably the second most expensive object that I own. And it's a nice wedding ring. It's not that nice, but it's a nice wedding ring, right? I don't think about this as a financial object. I don't go around being like, aha, look at this. This is worth another 100 bucks today because palladium or whatever this is made of went up, right? Um, and this, what we learned from Bonnie and her car was about this lesson that, that thinking about things as financial objects and ways in which society often presents decisions as financial decisions is not necessarily commiserate with how people think about these things. Um, once we had gone through people's wallets and had them sort of bring out all of their financial objects and uh, anonymize them. Did you notice the anonymization, by the way? I, this was a really nice um, little thing to make sure that we could... Again, I think it increased the level of trust that people had in us, that we were really taking their privacy seriously. Um, we'd look at the physical objects that they used to keep track of their money. Um, remember Charlotte? Charlotte with the storm cloud, right? Um, this is the spreadsheet that she used to keep track of her money. Um, she had a whole bunch of different credit cards. Um, she, had, she kept track of what the limit was on them, um, what the balance was, how much was due, and how much she paid. And she would just do a different chart every month. She would write, it, write this up and do this again. Um, and one of the things that was interesting, A, she had very complicated finances. She was often like shuffling stuff between um, her six or eight credit cards, things like that. She would do things like she made sure she would always very slightly overpay. So if you look at the, here, 
Um, here she had $46 due, but she paid $48, right? Here she had $108 due on this Capital One card, um, but she paid $110, right? And that idea that she uh, wanted to be, she wanted to have this, this history with, with the credit bureaus and with the credit cards of always being a good customer because she overpaid. And that way, if she missed a payment, she could say, oh, but I've overpaid for the last six months. Look what a good customer I am. And I think there's this really interesting thing that's going on here about, about the way that she's using the man's system against him, right? Um, that she's sort of, uh, in some ways, empowered by the, this ability to do things like this. So she was very interested in her credit score. She paid $120 a year to get her credit score um, from all three bureaus once a month. And she didn't have very much money. Like, so spending 120 bucks a year was sort of a relatively big outlay. But she thought that was the single best investment that she had ever made. And I thought that was a really interesting observation. Um, here's another way that people kept track of, of, of money. This is Veronica. Veronica lived in, um, in San Francisco itself. She had two kids. She had a husband who had a motorcycle business. Um, and this was her... Uh, way of keeping track of money. So if you look here, it's a little hard to see in this, but you can see up here she's got buy books, and she's got some math over here, and she's got some math over here, and there's sort of numbers in here and there um, where she's sort of keeping track of how things are going. There's some, more, there's some more numbers over here. Now, one of the things you might get from this is that this is not a very good way to keep track of your money. <laughs> Um, and she basically didn't really know what was going on with her money. And she had this almost, uh, this is, the techniques that she had developed were not necessarily optimized for the, for, the, for the needs that she had, right? So she had this system of keeping track of her money. But it was quite, it felt almost ritualistic, right? It felt that she would do these things, but they were sort of going through the motions rather than actually keeping track. And she did not know how much money she had in her bank account. Um, she was financially in reasonably good shape because of the way that her parents had set her up. And so she was able to survive perfectly well without really knowing what was going on. Um, and that was, you know, and that's, and that's fine. But she was still trying to do these things. We saw a thing that was not unlike that uh, in Doug. Doug was uh, 68 or 69, whichever I said at the beginning of the talk. Um, and uh, he lives in Burlingame. And he, he has been investing in municipal bonds since he was 21. Um, and for each bond, he has a, a card like this. So this is an Anaheim, uh, California redevelopment bond. Um, so that means it's a municipal bond, so it's tax-free. Um, it pays out, uh, in February and August, it pays out 375 bucks. So it's a $15,000 bond at 5%. Um, it's in the joint account, so some of his bonds, he has a, he has a girlfriend, um, a younger girlfriend, he was sort of quite pleased to mention, she's 65. Um, it was lovely, because he said it in this, like, I'm a dirty cradle snatcher kind of way. I was, it was, it was, I was quite fond of Doug, he was, he was dead good. Um, and every time that, that it would get paid, he would write down the, the month that it got paid um, on this particular card, right? Now, what was interesting was that he had this whole stack of cards, right? He had this whole set here, which he wrapped in uh, a piece of paper that had a spreadsheet on to keep track of it. And he'd go through every single month all of these cards to try and make sense of them and make sense of what was going on. And we saw that as being a kind of financial touch, right? In the same way that Veronica, with her doing the little math in the corner, would be this sort of financial touch. It wasn't that she got a great good picture of what was going on, but it was just a sort of checking that everything was okay and feeling okay about things. And that was something we saw again and again. Um, we'd see people log into their bank accounts. Uh, this is Anthony, who you remember is the other retired person. Um, Anthony didn't really trust like the stock market, so he had uh, $320,000 in his savings account and $114,000 in his checking account, um, and he didn't he didn't want to put it in the stock market or or, or anything or, or bonds or anything that was that, that, that was not reliable because um, he really just didn't trust that. And he had a bunch of real estate investments, and he trusted real estate. Um, but he would check in every now and then to see what was going on with his finance, finances. Um, let's skip over this, because I kind of want to wrap up to some interesting stuff. At the end, we asked them a couple of, of good wrap-up questions, um, some of which we took from that book, uh, the Stocks et al. Modern Couples book. Um, and they said, we asked, well, if you were given $20,000, what would you do with it? 
And then we said, well, if you were given a lot more money, like your, your total monthly, yearly income, what would you do with that? And then if you needed, needed $20,000 of a sudden, where would that come from? If you needed your whole income all of a sudden, where would that come from? I mean, with these questions, we wanted to explore some of these ideas around different pots of money, about different ownerships, different ways that people felt money was theirs or not theirs. Um, the three wishes question was, was, turned out to be not particularly interesting, but it, you, you get some interesting stuff. And, of course, these, the, all interviews should always really end with this, these, this pair of questions, which is, what should we have asked you? Because people often are like, well, if only you'd asked me this obvious thing. Um, is there anything else you'd like to tell us? And we'd get these great stories at the end. So then we did some analysis. We did things like print up uh, cover sheets for each one of the... Um, people we were working with. And that was a really nice way to get sort of a big picture view of, um, of what people were doing. These were the important things about these particular people and let us compare them. And I want to talk quickly about four things that I think are important. I'd promised five earlier on, but we're going to go with four. The first is this idea of checking balances, right? Now, 10 of the people we interviewed said they checked their balances at least weekly. Um, eight of them check every day or every other day. And right now, checking your balance looks like something like this. There's no context. There's no sense of what's going on. And I think there's an opportunity here to think about this as a resource. Because if this is what people are going to do, if this is how people are going to manage their finances, great. Let's take advantage of that, right? Let's use that as something to springboard to interesting things. Um, thinking about the role of the milestones in this. Uh, remember Alan, the guy with the, with, the, uh, with the chart that we started with, um, whose student debt was so crushing and they were living off peanut butter and turning the gas off? Um, when they got to the 50% mark on their student debt, they went out for a nice dinner. And that idea of recognizing the milestones, right? Can you celebrate the milestones? Can you explore with those sort of ways that you can enable people to meet their financial goals? Other people's money is a theme that came up again and again. I don't know how many of you use systems like Mint or Quicken, but one of the things that strikes you quite early on is they make this implicit in assumption that you control all of the stuff you put in there, that it's your money and it all goes into one big pot. And if you're married, if you have kids, if you have uh, parents who are getting old and going into a home might not be managing their own money anymore, you need to be keeping track of multiple monies, which are not entirely distinct. They might be slightly overlapping, but not entirely. And I think being aware of that and thinking about ways to provide tools to do those systems for providing awareness, not just for your own finances, but for a bigger picture. And then people want to be able to predict the future. Oh, that, planning is that word. Um, remember Octavia, the, uh, the doula, who had that, that balancing chart? Um, we noticed that on her Google Drive, she had this folder called Wedding 2013. We said, oh, great, can you show us this? Is, oh, you're going to have a wedding. That's nice. Thinking it was a little bit strange, because when we had asked her at the beginning whether she had a partner that, who she shared finances with, she was like, no, no, not really. Um, so it turns out she had a boyfriend. Um, and uh, amusingly, he worked at Dropbox, which, because she's using Google Drive, sort of tickled me. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's got honeymoon ideas and a palace of fine arts and dress and engagement ring and the wedding ring in platinum, three millimeters wide PDF, wedding budget, right? Um, now, she wasn't necessarily going to marry this boyfriend. In fact, it wasn't clear that, that... I think she had shared the folder with the boyfriend, but it wasn't actually clear that they were going to get married anytime soon or that they were even on a track to do so. Um, but she was planning for the future, and it's this, this is sort of the happy side of planning, right? Um, this is the, not the looking at the, the sort of depressing, uh, the, the twins that you saw there will presumably go to college someday. And I don't know if you've ever looked at those college calculators for how much college is going to cost in, um, in, in 18 years' time, 16 years' time, and then multiplied them by two. Um, that's a very depressing way of looking at the future. But I, thought, I, I like this because it points out that there's a joy to looking at the future and to planning those sort of things. So I think there's some opportunities here, right? There's opportunities for thinking about um, better ways to do checking, to do financial touch. Um, why not have a smart credit card that can display what its balance is on it, right? Why not uh, think about these, these tools for uh, allowing overlapping definitions of what it means to have access to either the money itself or to the information about that, recognizing there's different levels of privacy, um, 
it's been a really fun study, this. I'm looking forward to continuing it. Um, and I think thinking about the way that these tools really do impact the way that we think about money. Um, the 401k did not sort of spring fully formed out of Uncle Sam's forehead. Um, it was basically, somebody noticed it two years after it had been created by the IRS and realized that it was a very clever way to make a whole field of investment. And now the 401k is one of the dominant forms of financial instruments in the United States. Um, the tools that we use to think about retirement and to think about money shape our experiences of them. I think we have that opportunity to make some real big changes here. All right. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to have any questions. Did you uh, ever um, interview two people in a couple to see if there were differences? That's a very good question, and unfortunately, we didn't get that chance. We were trying to find a couple that we could do that with, and we had sort of scheduled, tried to schedule stuff on weekends, and not one of them ever came through, um, which is a great pity because I would have loved to have done that. I'll put that on the strongly in the follow-up category. Question over here. Um, thank you for this wonderful presentation of an absolutely amazing array of ad hoc methods of keeping track of your money. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it, it's amazing. Um, so I wonder, before we even go to better tools that are on your computer, maybe we should actually educate people about you know, how to think about money in the first place. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's something that we actually should teach them in the school that may be more important than exactly what was the time of a particular battle you know, in the, in the mid-ages or so. Um, so... I mean, this, this, this emotional and totally ad hoc way about thinking about money, I think it could be corrected if a little earlier mm -hmm. on you give a, a few basic hints and the like. And so whether we can do it in the school or whether it would come as part of the manual or the, you know, the initiation video that you have on your, on your Yahoo device at some point. But something needs to be done, I think, because this is, this is deplorable how, how this goes. Well, I think, it, I mean, I think it, and most financial education could be summed up as pay off your credit cards and save some money. Right, seriously, like 80% of people in the country need to understand this. Yeah. Um, and what I, my hope is that using things like rethinking what it means to do these, oops, what it m means to, to rethink these, these uh, interfaces for checking your balance, um, I think that's the, that's the opportunity that you have for financial education, right? What does it mean to rethink this and say, and this is what would happen if you paid off your credit card rather than keeping holding a balance, that kind of thing. But in general, I'm inclined to agree with you. I would love to see more financial education. So in, in the last few um, uh, months, I attended several of the UC retirement seminars. Mm. And a good part of the seminar is actually financial planning for your retirement. But I was thinking, this is a seminar you should get when you're a new employee. Because yeah. now it's darn too late. If you made a mistake 40 years ago when you could have set your course in a different way, that would have been more in interesting. It's not just at the retirement age when you finally should think logically about your money. Absolutely. So again, as a, an institution, we have something to improve here, I guess. Absolutely. Go over there and... I'm coming. So this is a great plug for, uh, we have this competition, I'm Barrett Wall, I teach entrepreneurship for engineers, and we have this thing called Big I Ideas, where different uh, students and, and researchers and things come up with ideas, and one of the six categories is finance, uh, and we're trying to provide educational tools, mostly geared for the high school and college age kids. So two things, one is... Um, we should send you some information. It's very info data. And also, every year we have the competition, and we're looking for judges. And we were wondering if... Uh, send, send me an email, absolutely. Okay, that's great. Hi. Um, I missed the beginning of the talk, so if this is a repeat, then my apologies. I, I was wondering, um, you got to see all of these different methods for keeping track of your finance, uh, some credit cards, some cash, uh, all these different things. Did you find different spending habits that... I mean, people would be afraid to go out for a nice dinner if they were to pay for it in cash versus on their credit card. Um, so yeah, that's a, if you look at um, particularly Sue's Orman is a is a popular press uh, uh, author who has done a lot of work in that particular question. She's a big fan of physically taking money out of the bank and you put it into envelopes and you have those envelopes. Um, for some people, that 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 advice seems to work very well. The problem uh, seems to be that then you don't keep track of it within those categories. And I think the great thing I know for me, I really like 
credit cards because at the end of the at the end of the month you can look back and say oh I you know that's where my money is going I re- really need to stop I don't know buying those super burritos or whatever it is you're spending your money on um, so we I don't have good statistical answer right I have anecdotal answer saying that some people do that and some people don't um, but I would love to sort of understand a bit more about that. Yeah, it, it seems you lose the ability to track your finances when you move to a more tangible means. Mm-hmm. But that tangible means might prevent you from spending the money in the first place. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you can track the money if you keep buying super burritos. Exactly, exactly. One more question here. Did anybody have a good personal financial tracking system going? And if so, what is it? <laughs> well, um, so there's one person who comes immediately to mind is Arturo, who I didn't talk about today. Um, Arturo lives uh, actually in Oakland as well. And uh, what was lovely about Arturo was his life was very, very simple. He actually sent me the spreadsheet that he uses that he puts together, and it had six lines on it. Um, and uh, he, and I think that's the thing that I got out of this. I mean. Whenever you do research like this, you always rethink your own habits, right? I mean, if you're doing research on health, then you're like, oh, maybe I should become more healthy or whatever, that sort of thing. Um, and I realized that, that simplicity uh, is, a, is a virtue in itself in this particular domain. And I think the people who seem to have the best control were doing simple things to keep track of their money. So instead of having, oh, well, I've got another, you know, I've got $10,000 in this savings account over here because it's got a slightly higher interest rate. It's like, no, just make life simple. <laughs> Put things in one place have one credit card as opposed to five credit cards, right? Um, so I think those were sort of the best systems that I saw. But I didn't feel like anybody had a particularly strong, really big picture view. There were people who had pro- uh, professional financial advisors, and they seemed to have a bit more of a sense of what was going on, or at least a sense that it was being taken care of. Um, but it's very, very complicated. Like, it's, it's a very complicated domain, and, and I don't want to give the impression that that I'm sort of pointing and laughing at people not having a good handle on this. Um, often people had what they needed to be able to... So people like Charlotte, with her like paper spreadsheet there, that was a system that worked for her, and it wasn't ideal in some ways, and it wasn't optimized, but it, but it did the right job. And we saw a lot of systems that were just good enough to do the right job, which um, I suppose makes me feel happy about the human race. All right, I'm happy to take questions by email, things like that. Thank you very much for listening.